just want to say it's great to see you all here today. Um, just like everyone else, I'm really glad these are back in person and uh, not virtual like we've had to deal with over the last uh, you know, couple years. Um, but anyway, we'll get, dive right into it. Uh, yes, so every, you know, every year crop insurance seems like we got changes, new things coming about. Um, not as many this year as the years past, but we do have a few things. Um, so first off, let's start with, this is probably the biggest topic, and maybe you've heard about it through uh, farm magazines or you know, radio shows. This has kind of been the, the bullet point, uh, it's, but it's PACE is the endorsement. It stands for post-application coverage endorsement. And uh, what this is, is an option for producers who like to practice a split-apply nitrogen program. So what you're doing is, is an under, it's an underlying endorsement to, or to your underlying revenue policy uh, or yield um, protection plan. It does not go with your area county coverage plans. Um, but what it does is protects the yield loss in the event that you cannot put that second application of nitrogen on in the growing season. Um, this is due to weather events, not due to um, the availability of not having the nitrogen or can't get it. So like last year may have been a good example where we had such an amount of rain in June, um, but that's where that's going to be calculated on. The windows of coverage, the, the nitrogen needs to be applied at V3 to V10. Um, and again, it's going to be based on, and I've, these questions have already come up, it's going to be based on what your individual APH and what factor you choose. You can elect a 75% to 90% coverage on the PACE endorsement. So the question came up though, well, how much nitrogen can I apply or how does it get figured? Well, it's a 1.2 factor and it's versus your a guaranteed APH. So, um, so you take 1.2 times whatever, you have to work with your crop insurance agent to figure out what that would be. Um, and then the question also, well, how much in it, do I apply pre or post? That is all depending on what you elect. Um, for example, the minimum you can apply pre is 20%. The max pre is 75%. So you can kind of do the math from there. So for like simple math, on 200 bushel APH at a 1.2% um, factor, say you want to apply 60% pre-planting or in the fall, that would come out to 144 pounds of N. And then you can do the math for what needs to be done at the post level. Um, so again, this is only on non-irrigated corn. There is not a, there's been some verbiage out in the news and I think that's kind of misrepresented. It's not, there's not a premium credit for signing up for this, but there will be some kind of subsidy. It is through the RMA, it's not a private product. So, um, so that is something to keep in mind as well. But again, this is very new. We are just getting verbiage on it and the quotas are just coming online, so I'm not gonna even try and get into uh, giving you kind of figures or rates at this time. So keep in touch, if there's something that interests you, uh, keep in touch with your farm credit insurance uh, agent. One thing though is this, it is a limited uh, program. As you can see where we sit right now, Sangamon County is not allowed to participate in this program. If you're from Logan County, Menard, uh, Macon, in Sir so Jack's area over in Decatur, uh, you would be eligible to enroll in this program. So uh, if this is something that interests you, again, and you want to get in the weeds more, talk to your agent as if you live in those counties. Uh, next thing, I won't touch on this too long. This is affects probably not as many in this room, but for organic uh, practices, uh, certified organic uh, needs to be... Uh, a plan needs to be in place by acreage reporting date. The new thing is now, uh, if you don't have a plan in place, but you have the documentation showing that you are in the process of trying to get certified, that that will be accepted by acreage reporting date. Um, same with transitional acres. There needs to be a transitional plan in place, or now the new thing is if you have a showing documentation that you are working with a certifying agent to get that plan in place. Uh, another one that I'm not going to touch on too long, whole farm revenue policy, a uh, few changes it. So whole farm is um, an insurance policy based on your total revenue for whole farm, uh, but you got to have a minimum of three different either crops or livestock can be mixed into that. Um, not something that we use a lot around here, um, but 
just some different changes, increase and expansion limits for organic stuff, um, and uh, just way you can certify your organic acres. The new thing is the micro farm policy, and again, this probably isn't gonna affect anyone in the room, but just we're touching on it, just to tell you what's new. It's more for, I would say, your um, farmer's market type, small farmer doing produce and things like that. So if there's any interest in those things at all, Again, talk to us after or meet with your crop insurance agent at a later date. Okay, now that's really, I said, so I told you there wasn't much new for 2022. Uh, we're moving in some key reminders that we want to look at as we go forward into the growing season. Um, this first picture, we're talking about the early plant dates on corn. Again, these early plant dates are based for your multi peril replant. So obviously planting before uh, April 5th is what covers this area for corn. Um, that you forego your um, replant endorsement on the corn. Uh, late plant is, uh, is June 5th for a lot of this area. So just a key reminder on that. Same goes for soybeans. Uh, this area is April 15th. And uh, final plant date would be June 20th. Again, this only affects your replant uh, endorsement for your multi peril policy. Um, there is some FAC dates, which FAC is following another crop. Um, that is not eligible in these counties where we're currently sitting. If you go south, that's basically just double crop beans. So there are different plant dates and something to be aware of for that. But for right now, that doesn't really affect where we sit now in regards to uh, FAC soybeans. So I lead into go from uh, talking about the multi peril of the federal crop replant, early plant dates into some replant endorsements. Um, these have become very popular in the last couple of years, as I'm sure well of you, most of you know, these, some of these springs have been pretty challenging, getting these crops in the first, second, maybe even third time. Um, and then last year, I know certain pockets, we had frost uh, pretty bad in certain areas for these early planted soybeans. So uh, what this is, is this coverage comes for both corn and beans. It pays on acre one. And in most cases, like especially for the soybeans, is what we're planting soybeans earlier and earlier. Um, depending on the insurance company, you, most of these um, programs have a 14 day to 20 day early go window. So you saw the April 15th date. This gets you more into that either April 1st or the end of March even. So really good stuff. Like I said, I think you know with a lot of the perils we're seeing and the challenges with these spring uh, weather, it uh, has been a very popular uh, item that we've been uh, selling so and also you can ensure a hundred percent interest versus when on your federal crop um, replant that's all by share so I'm gonna dive in here just want to let you see an example um, this is uh, soybeans on a um, hundred acres hundred acre soybean field 50 50 so like with you know aunt uncle or whoever your landlord is we're assuming a spring price of $13 and again, remember the early replant is elected 100% share coverage. So at $13, your estimated multi peril coverage is gonna get you about $39 an acre. Again, that applies though with the 2020 rule. So minimum either the lesser of 20 acres or 20% of the unit. But then look at the additional replant that you can buy up. Now, a lot of our policies, the programs go from about 50, 70, 75, it kind of hits the sweet spot. There's other increments, but those are the ones that are the most popular. For this example, we use $70. Um, so you can see on the multi pro replant at $39 at your 50% share, you're netting about $1,950. Add that replant endorsement that starts on acre one at $70 at 7,000. So, I mean, just look at the, what, I mean, just the gain you're getting and you know, what we've seen the last couple of years. I mean, you're planting an 80, 160, it adds up in a hurry. So just want to kind of show you the math. Um, I think, like I said, with all we've seen um, for the, and these pro products aren't extremely expensive, you know, just for what you're getting and the, and the peace of mind, uh, especially the earlier we want to go and try and hit those early windows. Uh, I think this is something that definitely needs to be, uh, if you don't have it already, a hot topic and needs to be discussed with your agent uh, when you sit down for renewals this, uh, this spring. And then this leads into, this is one of our biggest, uh, probably 
roadblocks we run into as agents. Um, I know you guys are busy in the, in the spring. Um, usually calling us isn't probably, you know, you don't want to be held up from planting. You think you call us and you got to have an adjuster come out and, and uh, you know, see, uh, you know, hold you guys up and you don't want to take the time. Well, it, you, it, what you saw with the dollars, it's so important. This, is, this applies to your multi peril your replant buy-ups. We need to be called first submit a claim and you need to be contacted by an adjuster before you can go and replant those acres. So it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, Friday night, weekend, we have cell phones, texts, call, doesn't matter. We want to get those in timely and because we don't want you to miss out on that because after the fact it's harder for us to kind of, you know, don't want you to lose on those dollars because after the fact there's not much we can do. So, um, so please don't hesitate to call us. And a lot of times, you know, now the rules have changed to where we can do 100 acres of self-cert. So a lot of times the guys will say, well, how many, the adjuster will call you, how many acres do you got? And, you know, a lot of times it's going to be under that 100, and he'll say, just keep track of your acres. You don't have to come out and look at it in most cases. So be mindful of that. We're trying to streamline it, and the, and the AIPs are trying to do, it, adjust, do adjusting uh, timely as well and not hold you guys up. So please, please call us ahead of time. Okay, a uh, topic we don't like to talk about, hopefully you don't have to talk about very often, is prevent plant. I know it came up a couple, you know, a couple years ago. We were, you know, going through the scenarios, thinking it might be something we have to look at. Um, things to know, though, for 2022, uh, well, I knew in 21, so for every eligible acre, it has to be, you know, planted, insured, and harvested in one of the last four years. So that means that if, for example, one of these, um, you know, hiccups as cause is if you picked up new land for, say, this upcoming year, and it hasn't been, you can't prove it's been insured in the, one of the last four years, it does not qualify for prevent, prevent plant. So something to keep in mind when you're meeting with us this spring, and we ask if you, and you know you've added land, please let us know, because we're going to have to look at this and, you know, walk you through it. And this came from the Dakotas, a lot of this, this rule, where they were prevent planting multiple years in a row. So even out there, they've started to work into their lease agreements, saying that the previous tenant must provide crop ins proof of crop insurance to the new tenant. And I know that can be a sticky situation, but this is the new rule, and this is what we're going to have to work with as we go forward. So something that's big. Um, coming down the pipeline if we ever come into a prevent plant scenario. Again, we must have timely notice of loss. Um, you know, for corn example, final plant date was June, around here is June 5th. You can submit, start submitting those prevent plant claims then. Obviously, you can still plant corn because you have the 20 day late plant period. You just lose 1% of coverage a day up until that June 25th. But even if you're thinking about around June, the beginning of June, we need to know so we can get a plan in place because we need to know, we've got to go run your prevent plant eligibility by crop. And again, we must know if it meets the 2020 rule like, the, like uh, your replant on your multi peril you know, the lesser of 20 acres or 20% of that unit. Other things to consider, um, you have the option to buy up your prevent plant coverage. Currently, the standard rate is 55% of your guarantee on corn. 60% on soybeans, so you can, you know, an extra 5% gets you to 60 and 65, respectively. Um, relatively inexpensive for this area, so if it's something you want to talk about or add to your policy, something we can easily do. Um, so then your other options are, well, what do I do uh, after electing prevent plant? Well, most common around here, the easiest thing to do, leave that ground idle. You get 100% payment of your prevent plant, and it does not affect your APH. Your second option is to plant a second crop, uh, which will affect your corn APH, for example, if it was corn, um, and you only get 35% of your prevent plant payment. So something to consider, and these are all key reminders that we want you to remember as we go into this um, upcoming growing season. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Jack Young, again, our Vice President of Insurance, from the Decatur office. Thank you, Blaine. Isn't it fitting to have a crop insurance meeting on January 18th 
and I think I saw before I left the house this morning, it's going to be 40 degrees outside today. And then in a few days, we're going to drop back down in the single digits for lows. So doesn't that, doesn't that tell us what crop insurance is to a T? Trying to insure risk. Top five rules of engagement. We don't have much change for this year, but let's talk about how we keep our pencil sharp, how you're ready if you are in the event of a lost situation and you've done everything you need to do to make sure you're ready for that situation and nothing stubs your toe. So the first thing is our production. The last few years, your agents came to you and said, tell me your production on such and such farm and how did you come up with that number? The RMA, the Risk Management Agency, the Risk Management Agency is now asking us to record how you folks came up with those production numbers. If it's a hard record or if it's a soft record. So that is very important. Know where that production comes from. Be able to document that in the event of a loss or in the event of an audit down the road. Hard records are something like your delivery records from an elevator, your delivery sheets. They're verifiable proof. It may be livestock records that you fed that you had measured by an adjuster. That's verifiable proof. Soft records, though, may be truckloads, combine records, anything that is soft that's not hard records that you show to put in a bin or something of that nature. Now, we always encourage you to come back at some point, once you empty those bins, if those numbers are different, and then prove up your APH with what the actual production was. So very important, soft records, that's still not been delivered to an end destination point, but it's records that you have that say, I hauled 12 truckloads off of that farm and put in that bin, or something of that nature. Hard records, delivery sheets to an elevator. Very important, gentlemen, remember, your, and ladies, your crop insurance is based off of your word, isn't it? They don't always ask you for that information until you have a claim. But boy, you better be able to prove it if you have a claim or in an audited situation. Very important. I don't want you to jeopardize a claim payment because of that. Next thing is also very important with crop insurance is your acreage reporting time. So we're not there yet. You still have that flexibility to plant corner beans on that farm that you're thinking about for this year. It doesn't matter. When you sign up for crop insurance on March 15th, all you're doing is making that election for your coverage. You still have flexibility to plant whatever crop on whatever field you want to at that point. Once that crop is planted though, it's set in stone. That's when the insurance attaches. Seed goes out of the planter, goes in the ground, that's where it takes off right there. From that, we've always look at the FSA as a way to verify what was planted where. When you report those acres, we've used those numbers for a long time. As technology has improved, as our methodology has improved, we can vary from that some. But it goes right back to like we talked with, with your production records. You better be able to prove that we are calling now mom's 80, 78 acres, and the FSA office is calling it 80 acres. What's that come back to sh for me to be able to verify that? Some kind of a planning record, some kind of, maybe an adjuster from one of our companies went out and measured that field for you and says, yep, it's 78 acres versus 80 acres. So with that being said, we've, we've just gotta be very careful on how you report your production. Excuse me, how you report your acreage. The other thing that's important that we need to talk about with your agent now and through planting if you're going to add any land to your farming operation for this year. You may not think that's relevant when you're deciding your coverage, but it, it can be relevant in terms of do you qualify for enterprise units? How are we going to add that database to your farming operations crop insurance? Can we use somebody else's records? And then with that, we talked about the FSA office. Crop insurance and FSA are tied together to an extent. It's important that you have your crop insurance policy set up as to how the grain is marketed on your operation. That could jeopardize a claim if you're selling your grain as Jack Young, but you actually have it, uh, crop insurance policy as Jack Young LLC. That can definitely jeopardize your crop insurance coverage. 
policy and entity shares should match at FSA. I mean, that's, that's very important. There will be exceptions, but it's so important to have things matching at FSA. I can't stress that enough. The other thing, the last bullet point on that right side, as we've seen some of the programs out with disaster, I mean, you think about the WIP payments, the potential, you think about your MFP and some of those other type programs, we have seen payments that were not allowed because of differences between your crop insurance and your FSA. So that's something I want you to definitely talk about with your agent. Make sure you've got it in the right order don't jeopardize yourself at either the crop insurance level or the FSA level. Another thing that I think is really important, um, crop hail coverage. Crop hail coverage to me is really important in a lot of different facets. Blaine talked about the replant option that's out there. Your federal crop has always got that static replant coverage. Every industry approved insurance provider has got a replant rider option that Blaine talked about. You've got to have some crop hail coverage to complement that to be able to take advantage of those programs. So that's, that's one reason to look at crop hail. The other reason to look at crop hail is for what it says. A lot of us, if we're on the enterprise unit structure with our crop insurance, I want a little bit of individualized coverage within my crop insurance from my crop hail. I don't want to take a chance of getting a crop hail storm on one field, the rest of my farms do well, and then subject me from not collecting on my federal crop side. So I think crop hail complements your federal crop really well, both corn and soybeans. And you can throw daggers at me and say, Jack, it takes a monster of a storm to have a crop hail loss on corn, right? I've never had a crop hail loss on corn. But folks, it is reasonable, doesn't cost a ton for the coverage you can get. And the one thing that scares the crap out of me is a fire. Remember, your federal crop does not cover a fire unless it is caused by lightning. So let's talk about that for a second. Remember, if you're going through the field and your bearing on your corn head gets hot and it kicks off a fire, and I just talked about 40 degree weather, right, on January 18th. Remember last fall when we harvest? How many times do we have a flamethrower of a torch of wind blowing 90 degree air at you while you're combining corn last year? More than once. Think about if you'd had a fire. That thing would have been gone before you could ever got in front of it. Your crop hail will cover that on your field to the level of your insurance. And that's why I think a crop hail is, is really important. Think about you're not even close to that farm and somebody drives by and throws out a cigarette on a hot, dry day, starts the road ditch on fire, and I've seen it. I have seen it. My producer one year was 20 miles away and he had a farm that burnt to the ground because somebody threw a cigarette out. Now, how are you going to find that person? How are you going to prove that person? What did it fall back on is crop hail insurance. Other things to go with crop hail, you've got your wind, you've got your green snap, and you've got your extra harvest. As these hybrids start to be more and more racehorse and stock integrity is not the number one thing it seems like, those are three things to have that discussion with your crop insurance agent about. What kind of coverage can I tailor to my operation to cover my risk? You know, and it may be a combination of those three, uh, maybe all three of them, but it's something to definitely look at because I think it really complements your federal crop policy very well. Those, those uh, green snap, hail, extra harvest, um, they have different types of coverage, different deductibles. Uh, there are packages out there that will work for what your risk mitigation is. So I encourage you to take a look at that with your provider. I don't say that you have to buy it, but I sure want you to say, Yes, I had that conversation with my agent this winter, and I know the risk that I'm trying to mitigate, and I know what I'm going to take. I don't want you to be caught thinking, man, I wish I'd have had that conversation with my agent back in the winter. Okay, we're about to renewal time, right? February, we set our average price. March 15th, you got to have that election made. You don't make an election, you roll over with the same coverage you had last year. Folks, you heard it from Gary Schnitke. We're going to hear it from Matt Bennett. The volatility's there. The weather risk is there. Your APH is going up, right? I think if we look at everybody's APH, you probably went up a level from where you were last year. You throw a 550 potential spring price, because remember we look at December corn during the month of February, 
whatever that average is, that's what our price starts out for crop insurance. Do you realize last year we were 468? Holy cow, our gov revenue guarantees could go up over $100 this year on corn alone. We could potentially be insuring around $1,000. $1,000, is that not profitable? Make sure you ask the questions, have the conversations with your agent because you don't want a hole in your coverage this year. Our double barrel shotgun is loaded. Same thing on beans. November soybean contract, the average of the month of February. I saw, or I was at one of these last week in Champaign. Matt was speaking. He's not in here now. But ever since then, beans have gone down since he spoke at the last meeting. But we're still 1290 right now for November soybeans. Last year, we were in the mid-11s, roughly. $50 an acre higher coverage this year on our soybeans than where we were last year, potentially. All right, we gotta hurry up, I guess. So I'm gonna have to cut it short. Other things that I want you to consider, remember with the last farm bill, ARC and PLC, price loss coverage, agricultural risk coverage, elections have to be made each year now as we finish out this farm bill. So you're gonna have to go into the FSA office and make those elections like you've done in the previous years. Remember, your price loss coverage, it's a floor. $3.70 and $8.40 is your floor. That's the price you're working with. If that market year average cash price goes below that, then it triggers a loss, just like in the past. The ARC is a county-based coverage. It's gonna use the Olympic average for the yield, the Olympic average for the price for your county, multiply them together, multiply that by 86%. That is your coverage with the ARC. What's my crystal ball say for those two products for 2022? Corn, you've got to look at your options with your crop insurance. Dr. Schnicky talked about the SCO option, supplemental coverage option, to add more coverage to your federal crop. The only way you can purchase that is if you have PLC elected on your farm program election. The only way you purchase that. If you're worried about price floor, PLC is your product. ARC, on the other hand, is more county-based and more, works more like your crop insurance. Do we think either one of them will probably pay in 2022? Probably not. And that's where I think you gotta come back and look at your crop insurance and your decisions that you're gonna make there with your base policy and then your add-on policy if you want to go with the supplemental coverage option. Uh, we talked about the potential for the spring price. Remember what goes into play when you talk about the premium cost for your crop insurance per acre. The first thing is that spring price. The second thing is your farm's APH. The third thing is the rate per county that you live in. And then the last thing is the market volatility. Until last year, our market volatility, think about that, our markets were pretty flat, right? I mean, we were in that $4 range, moving back and forth a little bit, but not a lot of movement. Last year, your premiums went up a little bit with your crop insurance because the market volatility jumped up as we were headed towards spring and through spring. This year, our market volatility is similar to where we were last year today. That's not saying that it couldn't change as we move into February. But with that, market volatility is a good thing because it's the measurement, basically in layman's terms, the measurement of the volatile, volatility, of, that's not even a word, is it? The volatileness of the market and it's a, it's a projection of it going up or down as we move to the fall time of the year. So stay tuned with that. When you talk about premiums for your crop insurance, they're probably gonna be up a little bit for next year because we're talking about more dollars of revenue coverage. Depending on the volatility, that may make them go up a little bit higher uh, or they may be similar to where we were last year. We'll, we'll know more as we get closer to February. So let, let's talk about uh, two more things and I'll wrap up and we'll go to questions. How's that? Don't skimp on your base policy this year. I think we got a chance to uh, do something we haven't done in a while. And if we don't use our crop insurance in the fall after this year, we had one monster of a year again. 
If you're going to guarantee me $1,000 or $1,050 with my federal crop on my corn, and if we don't have a crop claim, folks, that's great. Because $1,000 or $1,050, that's already got your deductible matched into it. We just had a monster revenue year. But with that being said, Dr. Schnicky talked about those add-on products. There's two that I want to highlight, and then we'll talk about a couple others. You've got the chance. Remember, your federal crop maxes out at 85%. Maxes out 85%. The government with the new farm program has given you the opportunity to add on some additional coverage. And that's what I've got up on the screen. Supplemental coverage option allows you to bump your coverage up from your federal crop. Say you're buying an 80, you can now bump up to 86 with the supplemental coverage option. What does that do for you? It works just like your federal crop except for it's on a county basis. On a county basis, not your individual yields. It is subsidized, and you can put those two together and have an 86% policy. It's an option. If you've been wanting more coverage, then last year new, the enhanced coverage option came out to the marketplace. As you can tell, crop insurance and farm program love acronyms. ECO, you probably heard that talked about. ECO allows you to go from that 86 up to 90, or 95 on a county level, on a county level. So when I say county level, it's just like your individual policy, except for instead of your APH, we use a county yield, expected yield for the county, just like your APH. Functions the same, allows you to go up to 96% if that's what you want. It may be something that works for your operation. Those are discussions that you're going to have to have with your crop insurance agent and talk about the pros and the cons for your operation. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what, doesn't matter what your neighbor's doing. It matters what works for your operation. Have those discussions, especially this year with your crop team. Here's on the graph, here's a, uh, here's a couple examples. You can see, if, if we look at the one in the middle, and that one in the middle, the, the, the middle one shows first the RP 80%. So that producer decided to go with 80% revenue protection. And then they added on the SCO coverage, which is county again. But it allows them to go to 80 to 86%. And you say, Jack, why would I do that? It's a way to gain a little bit more coverage than your revenue 85. If you're comfortable with going off a of county, it's a little cheaper for that 6% versus the 5%. And I say comfortable going off county. Remember, folks, if we're talking about a county that has variable soils, you've got to be careful. If you're in that south half of that county that has lighter soils and the dark half has darker soils and your yields don't mimic the county, you've got to be careful with those extra products that are based off county. And what I mean by that is, does that make sense? If I farm in the light side of the county, I sure don't want to be uh, maybe looking at that county option if that darkers are going to outproduce me a lot. So you got to be careful with that. Have those discussions before you tell your agents you're all in. And then lastly, you can go on up to the 95%. So that it's options. Those are I've been talking about county. Every one of the insurance providers that we work with, I believe, has got an option. If you say I don't want to go county, but I want to go by my own yields. I want to go higher with my own yields. There's options out there. They're not subsidized, but they're out there that will allow you to gain that extra coverage if you want. With that, uh, with that being said, I'm going to wrap up. Cover crops, remember in our zone, you've got to terminate your cover crops before emergence. As they become more of a player, that's something we've got to keep in mind. With that being said, I want to do two things quick and then I'll get out of the way. Number one, do you realize there's over 30 professionals at Farm Credit that are dedicated to crop insurance? Folks like myself, to the processing team, to the team that keeps things in line and works with our AIPs. Uh, with that being said, we've got agents in here today, Joe and Sherry from our Jacksonville office. 
raise your hand if you would, or stand up. And then we've got Garrett Stevens uh, with our Taylorville office. Um, go ahead, Joe, stand up for me, please. We also have Blaine and Michelle with our Sherman office. Gavin couldn't be here today. He was feeling a little under the weather. Um, and then we have Brigitte Volk, our, our re re uh, regional vice president. Is that right? All right, she's over our crop insurance division. So this is just a snapshot of the folks that work in our crop insurance team that are here at Farm Credit. And then with that being said, we also partner with four approved insurance providers. You know, there's only 15 that the risk management agency that will allow to sell crop insurance. And we are very stringent in who we want to work with and why we want to work with. And I'm going to show you why we want to work with the ones we're working with today. Would everybody with those uh, companies please stand up? I'm not going to call you out individually, but Farm Credit is very, um, very proud to work with these companies because as you can see, there's eight people right here that took time out of their day to come here. And that's one of the things that we are very passionate about at Farm Credit, relationships and, and working with you folks and having that personal connection. So uh, give these folks a hand for me, please, because they're helping take care of the lunch today. Okay, Jeff. 